Hello, everybody, and thank you again for joining this Criterion Edge webinar. For those of you that are not already aware, Criterion Edge is dedicated to helping IVD, medical device, and pharmaceutical companies advance compliance and enhance market success through industry-leading regulatory, scientific, and clinical writing services. Our webinar today is entitled Good Science vs. Bad Writing, Strategies for Building an Effective Scientific Writing Team, presented by our Director of IVD Writing Services, Dr. Sarah Chavez. Dr. Sarah is the Director of IVD and Scientific Writing Services here at Criterion Edge. She has a BS in biochemistry and a PhD in molecular and cellular biology with over 25 years of laboratory bench experience and has taught at the university level for nearly 20 years. She has extensive scientific writing experience in academic environment as well as for several large textbook publishers. Sarah's strong background in basic research and her extensive experience with regulatory writing will allow her to assist companies with IVDR readiness as part of the Criterion Edge team. I'm now going to hand it off to Sarah, who's going to kick it off with today's presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Justin, and thank you to everyone joining us today. Um, it, the goal of today's presentation is to really start to talk about what it takes to produce a document that is clear and concise and complete so that meets all of those basic regulatory requirements. But we also want to produce something that's effectively telling the story of your device. So we want to present some strategies that will help you to assess your current writing processes and offer some tips that we have for document preparation that will hopefully help you support effective writing partnerships within your organization. We also wanted to describe a few of the most recent themes that we've heard and some feedback from various notified bodies regarding medical device and IVD evaluation reports and try to offer some suggestions about ways to proactively design solutions to common concerns. And for most of us, those are things like time, budget, bandwidth, and resources. So we'll start out with discussing the timeline and then go into a little bit more details as far as bandwidth, the types of documents, and sort of a strategy behind what you need to have early on. And I also wanted to leave us off with some thoughts about how regulatory affairs could support some of these decision-making processes, um, which will leave us off with developing some practical strategies to support us as we begin the writing process. Now, I want to preface this whole conversation by saying I've been teaching writing intensive courses for pre-medical students for about 20 years now. And pretty much any time I send out a sign up sheet for help with your your writing and or your presentations, there really are two types of students. There's the ones who ask a million questions. They're waiting by my office door for office hours. But they also tend to be the ones who sign up first. And then there's the second group of students who I hear from the night before the presentations do, and they have a trillion questions, but they've waited until the last minute. So unfortunately, the medical device world I'm finding really isn't that much different. The students are the same, the questions are the same. So when our deadlines got pushed out a bit, a lot of the companies actually hit the pause button on their preparation efforts in order to take advantage of all of that extra time. But if you think about the purpose behind that time, if a teacher has noticed that an assignment is a lot harder than they thought, they extend the deadline to give you extra time to prepare. It's not meant to be a break in the exercise, but that seems to be the trend and sort of the, the impression that we're getting from a lot of companies. Another trend that we have definitely experienced firsthand is a tendency for the companies to begin to move up their FDA submissions ahead of the EU submissions by taking advantage of these extended deadlines. Um, and in my experience, that's usually where you try to finish up what you perceive to be the easier assignment first and then get back to the hard one. But think back to why they originally told us they were extending all these deadlines. It was ultimately to ensure the availability of medical devices and in vitro devices. And knowing that there are more strict requirements and this extended review process, there was a legitimate concern that some of these essential devices may not meet the deadlines and that could impact the supply chain, which could in turn impact patient care. So at the end of 2023, they, the European, the EU Commission um, conducted a survey and they published the results of this survey 
of a total of 39 notified bodies. It was ultimately tr attempting to assess how well we're doing in terms of our total certifications and applications under the MDR and IVDR. And that's currently evolved into this dashboard that allows you to monitor the availability of medical devices. Of the 39 participants who were part of this survey, 29 of them are MDR and only 10 of them are certified under the IVDR. But as you can see from this screenshot, this is their new dashboard. If you compare the total number of applications submitted versus the number of certificates issued month to month, that's a huge difference. There are a lot of pro products already in the review pipeline, and clearly the notified bodies are going to be quite busy for the foreseeable future. So really, our extra time is an advantage, but it's only an advantage if we know what to be doing with that time. So that's where I really want everyone to be thinking about this sort of concept of this timeline from multiple perspectives. The notified bodies have re been referring to the IVDR as a big bomb, which doesn't sound great for all of us who are about to enter into this exercise. There's going to be about 70% more products requiring notified body review, and the requirements are more stringent. So depending on the state of your current tech docs, it's estimated that a typical IVD organization will need about 12 months to uh, up to two years to begin to set up their systems and processes and to wind up with a completed tech file that's ready for notified body review. So realistically, your clock has already started, whether you're in medical device or IVDR. But this, these are some typical timelines as far as the lead time for technical documentation as reported by BSI. According to BSI, the average lead time for technical documentation assessment can range anywhere from one to six months for medical devices, but we're already out over six months here when it comes to the IVDR. So if you are not experienced with how to prepare these files and all of the notified body expectations, there's a good chance that you're already looking at a year's worth of preparation on top of the six months or more of waiting time. And if you get to the end of that time frame and then you realize you haven't met the requirements, at that point, you have a very fast turnaround to make any changes that are required or requested by the notified body. So any edits that are requested need to be done pretty much immediately. And it really does become this sort of all hands on deck kind of scenario. And that's typically when we see many companies choosing to pull in an external consultant for help. So what I'm proposing today is to suggest some steps that you can take to optimize your technical document preparation and processes prior to submission and to use your time wisely so that you can ensure that your products stay on the market and that you can get into the queue. So when I'm referring to timelines, I think it's important to realize that there are multiple timelines here. There's your own internal team's timeline, but there's also that external timeline for the review process itself. If you can keep your writing team engaged early in the process and develop a good system in place that will allow you to start to anticipate any potential notified body questions, it will allow you to be better prepared to respond when your turn comes up in this review pipeline. So one last point from the perspective of a college professor, again, my students typically don't notice what's missing until they go through a process of reviewing each other's papers. You know, I have them reach out to our writing center, to their peers and to their instructors, and that's where they start to notice the gaps in their narrative or certain opportunities that they can have to clarify some of the discussion points that they have. And really, the number one reason why IVDR applications are rejected is incompleteness. And just in case you think, well, oh, well, it's new, that's, that's to be expected, even for our MDR colleagues who've had a head start and have been doing this for a while now compared to the IVD crowd, still nearly a third of their applications are rejected for being incomplete. You don't see what's missing if you're too close to it or if you haven't seen other examples of these projects time and time again. And when you consider the average timeline for applications and certifications, 
having a solid gap analysis of your technical documents during this waiting process or even earlier in your preparations will allow you to have that time you may need to enlist extra help. So honestly, one of the main advantages that my team has is that we've seen such a wide range of applications for medical devices and IVDs and companion diagnostics. And we've seen some really strong applications and we've seen some less strong applications. You know, we've worked with clients who face substantial challenges in meeting those strict requirements for sufficient clinical data. Sometimes those are the legacy devices, and sometimes they're brand new novel devices. But the challenges of data and compiling these reports are truly affecting everyone. So you're not alone. But it helps to have somebody who's already seen similar documents who, first off, has experience with the medical device perspective, because a lot of the early guidance we're getting in the IVD space is referring to the previous guidance from the medical device perspective. And then B, we also want to understand some of the unique challenges that are posed by IVDs, where clinical data is going to be even harder than it was for the medical device teams. So that leads us to the second learning objective, which is sort of that self-assessment piece. You know, do are we ready to commit to this writing process? I strongly encourage companies to take a look at the various skill sets you have within your team, but also take into account whether or not you have the ability to pull a team member off to absorb all of the extra time it's going to take to start to dive into these new requirements and all of these reports that are being prepared. There is a fabulous article published in 2023 by Kearney et al. And they actually conducted a survey of manufacturers to figure out how they're meeting the challenges of the clinical evaluation report under the MDR. And no surprise, the high-risk devices tended to rely more heavily on the in-house knowledge um, compared to these medium-risk device categories. Because historically, the burden of clinical evaluation has not been as high for the lower medium risk categories compared to the high risk categories. They're already anticipating that they need to have some in-house expertise. But where I think it's interesting is that there is also this trend towards these external trainings that you're seeing more and more folks from the medium risk categories enlisting external training opportunities. But even among those high risk, there is a clear perceived value in reaching out to external consultants and experts to help you with that sort of blank, that that blank assessment. You know, we're coming at it from a fresh set of eyes and we can help you identify some of the gaps that you may be experiencing. There are also some trusted experts, whether it's MedDev um, Rev4 or MDCG guidances, IMDRF, MedTech Europe, all of those are also fabulous um, sources for information. But, you know, there is a lot of regulatory intelligence and going and digging into all of these various guidances and receiving that external training also takes time. So be sure to build that into the expectations for your team. One of the aspects of the survey that I also really appreciated was learning about the major pain points that companies have as they undertook the transition from MDD to MDR, because that really helps me anticipate the problems that our IVD companies are going to experience. And Criterion Edge, we've been working in the medical device space for quite a while, and these findings are not at all surprising. Clearly, everyone is concerned about data sufficiency. You know, we get asked pretty much every time we take on a new client, how much data is enough? And I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times we get asked that question. And our response is usually, it depends. And that's not usually what you want to hear. But truly, the amount of evidence required and the approach to identifying that evidence is critical for planning the strategy that you're going to take with these technical documents. So that's where it's really helpful to work closely with um, your team to develop a targeted search strategy and to develop really meaningful, well-supported inclusion and exclusion criteria to help you assess your data needs. That data, data and that process of generating that data, the screening and extraction can easily take hundreds of hours, but it's such a critical step. And having a system in place to help you 
generate that data and maintain sort of a database for all of your data sources is so helpful in the long term. That transparency and reproducibility, those are the key points that the reviewers are constantly emphasizing. And in my experience, you know, I've looked at many of the AI tools that are out there. In my experience, especially in the IVD space, AI does not have enough training to make the calls as to whether or not studies are relevant. They, It has not been great experience. That's going to be the most time consuming part of your writing process, but it's also the one that the reviewers are going to really closely scrutinize. So if you're going to build in time into your, your timeline and assess bandwidth, finding people who are capable of reviewing the data and extracting the data, that's a good place to invest your time and energy input. But the, think again, though, how are you going to cultivate this database? You know, this is a process. It has to be unbiased and reproducible. So any decision you make as far as I'm going to include a discussion of this study, but not that study, that all needs to be transparent. And as you are developing this process, it's the expectation is that you may be updating this on an annual or semi-annual basis. So you have this search strategy where you are searching for the most current documents and the most current data, and that timeline is going to change as you do updates. So you have to have a system in place to allow you to present a large amount of data and having a template that can help you present that data in a way that doesn't overwhelm the reviewers or make it seem unmanageable or disorganized. That's going to be key. Nobody wants to sift through hundreds of pages of narratives if you could replace that with a very clear data extraction table. But conversely, if you have uh, the challenge of having limited clinical data. Having a table with three lines or three studies is going to stand out like a sore thumb. So in those cases, it's absolutely critical that you assess that limited data in the context of your scientific validity. And you're going to describe all of the relevant clinical guidance pertaining to your subject device and take into account whether it's well-established or standardized, and that could account for some of the limited clinical data. In my experience, the more well-established a device is, the less data you're going to find in the most recent five-year time frame. So this clinical data requirement though, that's really has been the sticking point for most med tech organizations. So this is, if you're going to invest your bandwidth into any one of these, sections, this is really where you should invest your time and energy. Um, but one last note, because before we move on to the next learning objectives, I wanted to point out this fourth point here, that consistency and traceability. If you've never encountered this challenge, it's something that you should put on your radar and plan for in the future. So I just want to provide sort of a typical scenario. If you have an IVD that's been on the market for decades and, you know, it's been used for diverse indications across multiple populations over the years, there's a high probability that over those years, over those decades, some of the indications may have seen advances. And there may be other tests out there that are more appropriate for those clinical conditions because of the evolution of the state of the art since the time that your device hit the market in the first place. So we need to evaluate whether or not your device is still state of the art with all intended purposes. So you can still be state of the art, even if your device has undergone this evolution, but you need to show that you have enough clinical evidence to support each one of your claims under your intended purpose. And if you have made a change to your intended purpose or one of your populations or indications, that change needs to carry through and be reflected across multiple documents. So you need to make sure that you have a system in place to review the relevant sections across those documents to ensure that those changes are carried over. That process of ensuring that consistency is just a really key example of how a lot of these changes have ripple effects and what you think is going to be just one quick change, I'm just going to change this one word in the intended purpose, it can result in you having to go through multiple documents to find that those changes and make sure that they're all consistent. 
And I point that out because, you know, under the MDR, there's been a huge increase in the amount of outsourcing of the clinical evaluation reports, irrespective of the company's size or even their risk classification. So this same survey of manufacturers found that mo while most of the respondents don't outsource the generation of their CER, the ones who do indicated that they used to produce it in-house, but since the implementation of MDR, they that's when they started outsourcing. And for many of them, when they outsource, um, they do it for, they tend to prioritize those high-risk devices. But if you look at those individuals who decided not to outsource, they tended to be these really large companies rather than the small to mid-sized companies. So in the next survey question, they were asked to explain why they're outsourcing. And it typically comes down to a, a mostly even split, split kind of a 60-40 split between lack of expertise and time and resources. Um, no, I think it's funny that no one says it's more cost effective. You know, this whole process is not cost effective. But when you put it in the context of time be equaling money and delays can have a huge impact on your budget in in a way, you know, maintaining that time and maintaining your resources is more cost effective in the long term. So further data analysis was performed to dis determine whether or not there was a trend in the extent of outsourcing between those small to medium size versus the larger ones. 50% of the small to medium sized companies outsourced their CERs compared to only about 18% for large companies. So if you are part of a company that's ruled out outsourcing any of these because you've considered, you know, you've considered the cost of developing these documents and all of those factors, I do encourage you to start to think about some of the potential needs and the benefits within your organization of working with a consultant early to help you develop a process to support your writing team internally. If you have a strong process that's sustainable, it can help you save a massive amount of time for your team in preparing these technical documents and set you up for success in the long term, not just in the preparation of this one report. And I previously mentioned that incompleteness factor as being kind of a, a pet peeve. It's one of the primary reasons for rejection in both MDR and IVDR applications. So another notified body here, in this case, TUV sued, they published a list of some of their key tips to support manufacturers as we assess the tech files. And they actually specifically called out that many of the manufacturers lack the writing experience. They don't know what these documents are supposed to look like. And the notified bodies in most cases are experienced with reviewing these documents from the medical device perspective. So they have a sense of what they're expecting to see. And they're trying to convey that. But if you've never seen those documents, it's really challenging. And so, you know, you have to ask yourself, what gives the notified body the distinct impression that a company doesn't have experienced technical writers? You know, a lot, a few of their key suggestions are really centered around that concept of consistency and completeness. Having a tech doc file that's readily searchable and well organized. And that goes back to that whole concept of templating, hyperlinking, making sure that if you refer out to a section, that changes carry over across multiple sections. They also point out, though, things like the manufacturing information not being detailed enough or certain pieces of design information just being missing or a lack of detail. Those claims in the IFU versus the performance evaluation report, um, that's a, a big challenge that many of them have cited. Um, and then also having a strategy to develop and demonstrate that clinical evidence. So that goes to your search strategies and how are you actually going to compile and maintain this sort of active surveillance? How are you going to show that you are actively seeking out any and all opportunities to identify relevant clinical data as it's being presented? Um, you also want to look at the clinical evidence for legacy devices. Just because you've been on the market forever doesn't mean you're necessarily meeting the requirements. They have gotten to be harder, and that is a particular challenge for the legacy devices. So I found it interesting that they 
they called that out specifically. Um, and the fact that, you know, picking things like your competitor devices carefully and showing why you consider that to be a competitor device, that's also an important piece. Um, and I think all of this kind of speaks to this whole concept of post-market activities. Once your device is on the market, how have you developed a clear system, a plan that's going to help you continue to collect and assess all of this data on a regular basis without driving yourself crazy? So as someone who's tasked with preparing a lot of these technical documents, these are some of the simple steps that I take during the systematic literature review planning process that help me avoid the deficiencies. So first off, the intended purpose, you know, that is going to be critical. We want to define our questions very tightly at the beginning of the search process. I can't tell you how many times we've been asked to jump in to support a project where a change in the IFU required them to basically redo their entire search strategy and pretty much go back to the drawing board. So that can be extremely frustrating from the company's perspective, but it is an avoidable pro problem. You know, we can plan accordingly from the get go, and that can help you make some of these decisions very early on. Um, another point I like to make is that we work with companies at all stages of the product life cycle, whether they're a legacy device to a device that's even undergoing development, like it may still be in the R&D phase. So for a company that's looking to take a peek at whether or not they're going to be state of the art, that systematic review process early on, especially conducting a state of the art search or a guideline search can be extremely valuable. So as soon as you can conduct that state of the art search, that will give you a really solid sense of some of the key recommendations and guidances and help you understand really where your device sits in the broader landscape. That's where you're going to identify those competitors and you're going to start to see some of the, um, the potential competition that's out there, but also give you a preview of some of these various safety and performance objectives. Um, choosing the right safety and performance objectives is critical, whether you're a medical device company or an IVD company. So I think this is a good point to make as far as another example of those ripple effects. So suppose you have a company that's looking to develop a test to assess antibiotic resistance in infection. Often they don't really have a solid sense of that guideline search. So they don't know what the guidance says pertaining to how antibiotic resistance testing fits into the clinical diagnostic algorithm. But they also typically don't know going into it whether or not the same types of resistances are seen across diverse populations. And if that could potentially impact the design of their test in different markets. But if you have that knowledge, if you've conducted a state-of-the-art search in diverse populations very early on, it's entirely possible for you to conduct one large search that is applicable and can be stratified across EU, US, and Asian submissions in populations. So in many cases, if we know that this is a critical need, that this is a fact-finding mission, we can I create a search that allows you to identify data relevant to each population. And then during the process of screening that data, you can screen the data separately from the same combined search to allow you to prepare data sets in support of EU, US, and Asian submissions. That saves you a substantial amount of time. So it allows you to view those submissions. They're independent projects. And in many cases, in our experience, companies often have independent teams. You know, one team will be working on the FDA submission. Another will be working on the, I, the IVDR submission. And they will be conducting separate searches and everything is duplicated. Whereas if you have a combined search strategy that's broadly applicable, it can be used to support all of your submissions combined. And by taking that little bit of extra time during this planning stage, you can develop a system that allows you to support your decision-making across multiple markets 
but can be updated very easily. And that allows you to save, save a substantial amount of time and resources. Um, another quick example of how this could potentially impact you early in the process. We had a client who was preparing a clinical study protocol. And they were trying to determine how many um, performance objectives and what time points would be the most appropriate. So they had their preliminary clinical study protocol and they were trying to make sure that it was going to be relevant. So we conducted just a competitor search. We They gave us a list of who they would consider to be their primary competitors and we extracted data and created sort of a landscape analysis of all of their competitors. And by doing that, we were able to provide them a list of the most commonly reported and the most clinically relevant performance objectives and the time points that were commonly reported. And it happened to be different from the ones that they had initially planned. I believe they had planned to collect a three month time frame, and we were finding that most, if not all of their competitors were reporting at one, two and three months. So had they conducted their trial as they'd originally designed, it would have been extremely challenging in their clinical performance report to compare the performance of the subject device to the competitor devices because the time points and even some of their performance objectives were not aligned. So really, these searches are critical, but they're time consuming. So you want to be confident that the questions you've developed and the searches that you've started with are the most appropriate for your project. And that is going to save you a lot of time and headaches in the long term. So this is how I typically approach my scoping process. When I take on a new project, I need very basic pieces of information before I can even get started. And some of these I mentioned before, like intended purpose, we absolutely need that before we get started. Um, we also need performance criteria, but we we want to have a solid sense of population, indications, comparators, and outcomes. That's the PICO terms here. That's going to set let us set the stage for our searches. If there are certain populations that you specifically mention in your limitations, I need to know that. And I can design the search in such a way as to exclude those populations so that I'm not spending all my time screening unrelevant articles. At the same time, if you don't know who your population of interest is, if you are claiming a broad population that you can be used for the general population, but if we start to identify through the course of the searching and the extracting that there are some limitations that could result in this process ultimately feeding back and in, in creating implications for your limitations here. We may find data, for instance, that explains that there's a certain interference or a cross reactivity that could impact the performance of an IVD resulting in false positives or false negatives in a particular population or in a certain scenario in a real world setting. You know, it, individuals who are immunocompromised are often excluded from many of our immunoassay studies. Uh, these are typically presented in the literature as a case report or a case series. And I've seen many times where that's actually an exclusion criteria as being a case report or a case series. I include those in my searches. I don't exclude them until I get to this stage because I want to see those case reports. I want to see if there is sort of a red flag that's being thrown up in the published data that could indicate that I may need to make a necessary change to my indications for use. That's what the notified body is expecting to see. That's what the reviewers want to see is that you have a way to prospectively collect information and then feed it back to make necessary adjustments to your key indications. Um, so I often begin when I reach out to a client, I usually tell them who's the main, like the, the head person. If you think of this particular indication or this particular type of field of study, what names come to mind? And so I usually look up articles or like key review articles, um, you know, any sort of pivotal publications. If there's a particular study that everyone references, I look for the most cited articles pertaining to that general topic area. And that's where I start with identifying 
mesh terminology and key keywords that are part of the full text. Depending on your subject area as you're designing the search, mesh terminology can be very, very helpful. But for many of the IVDs, I'm finding limiting to just mesh terms in your searches can be really challenging because often the IVD itself, the accuracy of the test is not the full purpose of the article itself. It's presented as sort of like, you know, anecdotal data or just sort of supplemental data. You know, a lot of the key information we're looking for is supplemental to the focus of the article. So in some cases, I'm finding, you know, searching the full text for certain keywords can also be really, really helpful. But we work closely with the client to try to choose, you know, everything from the most relevant time frame to the number of databases to search. We often get asked, can I just do a PubMed search? And while you can, I will caution you that you're going to miss a lot of data that's published in EU specific journals. So we always recommend searching at a minimum Medline and Embase. And there are platforms you can use to simultaneously search across both databases using that sort of keyword scenario that allows you to deduplicate so that you're not screening one set of articles from Medline and a separate set of articles from Embase. And that allows you to be very confident in the completeness of the data that you're pulling from. But ultimately this process, I highly encourage you to work with a qualified medical librarian. That is going to save you a massive amount of time because depending on what your topic area is and which keywords you're incorporating, you may be developing searches that are so broad that you could literally be getting back thousands of articles that require manual screening. And that will take you hours and hours and hours. And you're going to find most of those articles are off topic or not relevant. And so if you can drill down and get the search really tight, it will save you time not only on this first go at preparing your application, but in subsequent updates as well. It really allows you to focus your time and energy on the articles that are going to have the best chance of being the most relevant. So whether our client is small or large in terms of the company size, we always recommend connecting your writing team with your regulatory affairs team. That's very helpful early on in the process because in our experience, the regulatory affairs teams tend to have a better sense of the big picture, that larger perspective, not just the one report that we've been tasked with writing. So if our clinical evidence has implications for other key technical documents or could require a revision, like for instance, if we identify, hey, we found three case reports of this particular interference or cross-reactivity, you may need to go back and update your IFU accordingly to show that sort of post-market surveillance is act alive and well. That's part of that sort of coordinated conversation. So don't fall into the trap of viewing each of these reports as like a standalone report. Make sure you're viewing it in the context of the larger process. And that's really one of the challenges that I do see in terms of the outsourcing if there's not proper communication. We don't want to provide you a document that is complete within that document, knowing that there are these ripple effects that could potentially impact that consistency. So trying this a la carte approach where you have different team members each producing only one report, but there's not really that sort of connection or that that sort of review across these various documents is a very calculated risk. Um, you know, ultimately, we want to build a strong connection between the writing teams and regulatory affairs to ensure that you're building consistent, cohesive templates and reports that are feeding into one another and are being updated accordingly. And one last key point I wanted to make in terms of that ripple effect and the impact of making changes. Sometimes, and at least in my experience, most of the time if a change happens as a result of the search and the process itself, 
there's usually something that we encounter during that state-of-the-art analysis where a clinical evidence requirement is not being met across all indications, or there's a particular limitation that we're noticing, or maybe it's not state-of-the-art for all of the various populations anymore. So that is part of this feedback. And that's where most of these sort of flow charts that are described have this bi-directional arrows. You know, the arrows are supposed, it's not a linear process. If you get through the process of searching, you appraise the data set and you realize we don't have enough data. It may require you to go back to the published literature and reevaluate your search strategy. But unfortunately for many of us, it could also require that you need to identify additional clinical data pertaining to your subject device. And that's what I think most folks are trying like crazy to avoid. Um, so regulatory affairs really comes in here because they bring their knowledge and their expertise about how to plan these pro these conversations to ensure that all of these technical documents and the implications of changes are fully appreciated. And that allows you to incorporate any new updates, whether there's a new risk or a new potential indication that's been identified. If you can then incorporate that into your search strings, it allows you to be evaluating this process as you go and ensure that your searches are going to be very targeted and very impactful. And the notified body can see that you're taking the information you're gathering in the scientific report and you're applying it to the next time you do this search. That's really what they're looking for here. So I I always like to conclude presentations with some of my demotivational posters. Um, for many of us who've worked in labs, these seem to be very commonplace. So I, I can't tell you how many of these I have seen in pretty much every lab I've worked in over the years. So the first one here is risk taking. So from a practical standpoint, if you try to take on submissions alone, or if you have a very tiny writing team, if you have not already attempted to produce these documents yourself, and you're trying to do it just based on the guidance alone, that's a calculated risk. The requirements can seem very complex. And even as we saw from those survey results, the companies with previous MDR experience are still struggling to keep up to date with all of the most recent guidance and those tips from authorities. So don't underestimate the importance of that sort of regulatory intelligence. We certainly learn from the mistakes of clients, but also some of the really interesting strategies that certain clients take in terms of identifying data sources that help. we can then apply to new projects to help you sort of make good choices very early on. My next recommendation is this project management piece. That is absolutely critical. There are so many reports that are flo floating around and different team members are typically assigned to each of those reports. Version control becomes a really big issue. You may have people updating feedback or replying to comments or tracking changes, but if there are 10 different versions of these documents floating around internally, it's really important to have traceability and trackability of these documents. So I highly recommend assigning ownership for writing reports to one key stakeholder, but then developing a system in which you can obtain consolidated feedback that allows you to conduct these sort of cross-functional team reviews where you have R&D reviewing it, you have regulatory affairs reviewing it, you have Everyone is reviewing these documents, looking for the pieces that are relevant to their documents. That allows everyone to ensure that consistency across reports. So just because you don't think it impacts you, does it, that doesn't mean that something that's said in one report doesn't create some a misalignment potentially with something that's in one of your report. So giving everyone a chance to comment and edit and approve can be challenging, particularly if there's not a consensus with certain aspects of the device, or if you have regulatory decisions that get changed at that last minute, that can certainly impact your timeline. So build in time for this cross-functional review. There are so many moving pieces and that can be overwhelming. 
And I think as scientists, we've all experienced the struggle of trying to read a friend's manuscript or a report. And it may be some like a topic area that we're super familiar with, but we've all seen what happens when they're just not getting the point across. You know, the science is great, but the writing is less than stellar. And like, quite frankly, not all scientists are very good writers. And a lot of us have even less time or desire to even take on the writing task. You know, we get into science because we enjoy the science. But we have to start thinking about these reports from the reviewer's perspective. They are expecting you to tell them a story of your device. They have to be given a lot of information, but if you haven't clearly laid out your arguments and ensured that that narrative is cohesive and really tells the story, it's really easy for the reviewers to miss out on important details. They are not going to take the time to connect the dots. If you don't tell them why a piece of information is not relevant and therefore does not need to be included in this report, they are going to assume you just forgot about it. So even simple things like saying this particular performance objective is not relevant because this is a qualitative test, not a quantitative test. You know, taking a moment to review it from their perspective. You have to tell them those things. They are not going to extrapolate or draw conclusions that are not expressly stated in these documents. And given the fact that their review times are so long, and the but the amount of time that they actually spend reading through your documentation is relatively short. So if they cannot easily locate that pertinent information, they are not going to keep digging through your tech files to find it. Hyperlinking, clearly labeling appendices, all of those things, developing a strong, solid template is the job of the writers. That helps you organize your key discussion points, but ensures consistency and formatting the, a clear flow and an easy navigation. This is where I, I tell people it very much pays to be OCD. And ultimately, it comes down to the amount of time and bandwidth. You know, when you have an endless supply of expendable labor, this may not be an issue for you, but that's not usually the case for most of the teams we work with. The documents will take more time than you think they're going to take, and many of us are being dragged in a million directions anyway. So writing these technical documents may not have even been part of your job description, but it is now a necessary part of the regulations. So training an employee to tackle these tasks could wind up taking them away from what their actual responsibilities are and may not actually be the best use of your time and resources. There are some aspects of this that you can outsource. But that being said, there are a lot of writers who are coming into the industry with the goal of producing a product. Really quickly, you can tell they're using AI to do the writing or other tools that do the job for them. Don't underestimate the importance of having expertise in that medical device space and having people who can write without AI help. That's going to help you navigate some of the less than clear guidance that's out there. And, you know, to a certain extent, the rules that we have are very proscriptive. They, If you do what they ask for and you follow their rules, generally speaking, the notified bodies are, are happy with the product. But sometimes there are devices that don't fit cleanly into one of the categories or the rules are just not quite right. And or unfortunately, we're waiting on updated guidance and we don't have time to wait for that guidance to be published. So that's really where taking the time to consult with someone who's seen a variety of different projects and different pathways to approvals, that really helps you navigate those sort of unclear scenarios with a higher degree of confidence. So just to summarize, if you're building your writing dream team in your in-house or you're building in sort of a combination of in-house and outsourcing, De develop a realistic timeline. You need to know where your current documents are in the pipeline. Are, are any of them finalized? When are they going to be finalized? Because there are these ripple effects that happen and one document can hold up the entire process. 
conduct these cross-functional consolidated reviews so that you can ensure consistency across the documents. That is absolutely critical. So don't think that, you know, one team is going to handle analytical, the other team handles um, clinical, that they're never going to interface with one another. Everything should be cross-functional. That transparency and reproducibility in the systematic literature review process is a requirement and an expectation, but it takes a lot of time. So build in time to allow you to develop a process that is going to be consistent. Your templates should be really easy to navigate and the labeling for the reviewers should be very intuitive so that they don't have any issues finding the information they're looking for in your document. If you have a conclusion or a discussion point, state it directly, do not imply it. And your acceptance criteria needs to be developed to best reflect the current state of the art, not what was state of the art when your legacy device came on the market 50 years ago. But ultimately that consistency is key and we need to stop thinking about the document as being a product. It really is this process of writing the document. That's the more important piece that, and really what the notified bodies are on the lookout for. So I like to kind of leave off with another kind of nerdy science example. Um, if we take a cue from some of our most successful partners in the natural world, our fungi and algae, um, we have these lichens, which are basically these broadly successful keystone symbioses. They are some of the most diverse, impactful, widespread, mutualistic relationships. They allow algae and cyanobacteria to grow on a rock or on a, in an environment that would otherwise be significantly challenging. But they form these symbioses in, in a way that it's mutualistic. Everyone benefits. It allows them to become dominant in certain habitats, even in the extreme habitats. But I think what makes them so successful is that flexibility. You know, that partner flexibility, that is really integral as far as developing a relationship. You need to be on the lookout for partners and writers on your team that have a broad skill set, that have broader experiences, hopefully in the medical device, IVD, pharmaceutical, or sort of that cross training. That allows you to have more of that versatility and a wider range of experiences in the global regulatory space. So we have a little bit of time left for questions. I know I pulled a few of the questions from the um, the, some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So I have a few of those here. And it looks like one of them um, in the uh, Q&A button here has asked about project management tools and programs. Um, so I will tackle that one first just so that I don't forget it or, or lose out on it. Um, so ultimately, it depends on what systems you have in place. I can say the main pain point for most companies is figuring out a way to share documents and allow you to comment and track changes and keep track of who is making what changes and edits. That version control is huge. So I typically recommend creating a shared document in something like a box folder or a SharePoint. Um, in my experience, Google Docs, it messes up a lot of the formatting. So don't wait and, you know, wait until the end to do the formatting because Google Docs will wreck it every time. But having a system in place that you use to assign tasks, um, I even use the comments within the document and I at people. So I, I will say like this person from this team, I need you to confirm this piece of information. And I encourage folks to use the comments, but not close the comments. I encourage them to resolve the comments. And that way you have that trackability of, didn't we have a question about this? Did so-and-so go back through this and actually fix that part? Okay, yes, I see back on this date, they addressed that concern and here we go. So saving copies though, along the way is also helpful. So I have a shared drive um, and I will send out a link to the partners for writing 
when I go in every morning, I archive a copy of it so that in the event that one team member is not as skilled with the shared files and accidentally deletes someone else's work or overwrites it, which can ha and does happen, you have the ability to go back to the previous version of the document. That helps a lot. So save multiple copies. That would be my main, um, my main takeaway. Um, some of the other questions that came in during the course of the um, uh, sort of the the previous the registration, a, a lot of folks were asking about you know regulatory writing. How is it different from other types of scientific writing or medical communication? To me, it's very proscriptive. It's more like writing a legal brief where don't give them more than they ask for. Give them exactly what they ask for, but do so in a very organized way and, you know, avoiding sort of flowery language and making sure that it's, it doesn't feel like marketing language. I think that's the main takeaway that I have. When you have folks from a marketing team who are writing some of these documents, they tend to exaggerate the importance of certain pieces of information. Whereas we want this to be almost a little bit dry, but we do want to clearly state the conclusions that can be drawn reasonably from the data that we've presented. So that's where those objective acceptance criteria really come into play. So just kind of following the rules and sticking to what they ask for. Um, there were some, some folks were asking for training resources if you have non-science writers to become better science writers. That I think, um, I tend to go with, um, there are certain resources available through PubMed. Um, for instance, Stat Pearls is an online um, book that provides a good high level overview of the topic area. It's, it, it's sort of the main challenge that we face is, do you find someone who's a good writer and teach them the science? Or do you find somebody who's a scientist who can sort of write and make them a better writer? And, you know, it's it's kind of a combination of both. But I would say I tend to start with, if it's a topic area that we are not as familiar with, I always start with stat pearls and some of the other um, websites and just a really solid review article that's written for a lay audience, ideally. But that will really allow your non-science writer or sort of a non-expert in the field to become acquainted with some of those key terminologies that are going to be important for them to know moving into the project, to really be able to start to make some of those key arguments. But that's part of where having a dialogue between the scientists and the writers is really, really helpful. And that cross-functional review, you know, the R&D team can say, oh, we don't really say it like that. We would prefer to use this language, or this is the way we would say that. They'll be able to help you with those pieces. And then I believe we answered this question, some of the tools and the templates. Um, the tools, I would say, developing a system to archive your work, that, that's the main takeaway, and to track changes regularly. That way you have a version control and a clear documentation of the process and the decision making that has gone through the entire process. That will help you immensely. So thank you to everyone who's attended today. And um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We are always happy to um, consult on additional um, questions or just to come up with some different topic ideas of things that could potentially help you in the future. Lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for everyone for joining. We'll stay on for another minute or two in case there's any last minute questions. As a reminder, uh, the recording of this webinar will be sent out in the coming days. So please keep an eye on your inbox for that. And if you do have any uh, following questions after the presentation is concluded, feel free to shoot us an email at consult at criterionedge.com, or you can use the meeting link uh, in the chat itself to book a time with one of our experts. Thanks again. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Oh, yes. Um, there is a question in the chat about the book recommendation. Um, I will go ahead and type it in the chat here. Um, the name of it, um, let me see if I can post it here. Um, it's called Stat Pearls, S-T-A-T 
pearls, like the 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 gem. <laughs> like uh, so, it's um, available freely in PubMed. So, in my experience, you don't have to pay for any of those articles. It has a really solid overview of many types of medical devices and IVDs, and even just general topic areas um, to get your team started. So just in terms of that basic information, it's a great tool. We'll give it one more minute in case there's anything else that comes up. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Indeed. Until next time.